Hi, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. In this episode, I'm going to tell you all about Sharon Tate and how she was murdered by the Manson family. Real quick before I get into that, I just want to let you know that I am currently holding a giveaway for a $25 gift card to Spencer's or Spirit Halloween store. The winner will also receive their very own Broken Limelight t-shirt. If you'd like more information, make sure you stick around to the end of this episode and I'll give you all the details then. Sharon Tate was a famous model and actress in the 60s. She was known for her roles in Valley of the Dolls and The Fearless Vampire Killers. She was born in 1943 in Dallas, Texas. Her father was in the U.S. Army, so her family moved around a lot throughout her childhood. By age 16, she had lived in six different cities and found it hard to maintain friendships. She was said to be kind of a shy person. She was also absolutely beautiful, and people noticed. So she started doing beauty pageants in high school until her father got stationed in Italy and they had to move there. At first, she got work as an extra, and people started to notice her, like she stood out. In 1962, her family moved back to the United States to Los Angeles, California. There, she was introduced to Martin Ranzahoff, a director and producer who was a douchebag. He offered her a seven-year contract and then was super controlling of Sharon. Sharon was quoted as saying, Martin didn't want the audience to see me until I was ready. So he made her spend all her time in lessons for acting, singing, dancing. He put her in, like, nutrition or exercise programs to help her lose weight. He did put her in a couple TV shows that he was producing, like Mr. Ed and Beverly Hillbillies. But Marty was also working in bigger films, so he was intentionally keeping her in small roles. Sharon also once joked, I can't fart unless Marty says it's okay. He finally gave her a bigger role in the 1965 film Eye of the Devil. Marty had actually included in her contract that she wasn't allowed to get married during those first six out of the seven years of her contract. In 1964, Sharon met Jay Sebring, a former sailor who was then one of the leading hairstylists in Hollywood. Sharon started dating Jay, against Marty's wishes, and they eventually got engaged. In response, Marty made sure she had a fully booked schedule with acting classes and stuff seven days a week. Marty was set to direct the film Dance of the Vampires, which was directed by Roman Polanski. Marty made them change the name later to the Fearless Vampire Killers. At the time, Roman was dating actress Jill St. John, and he wanted her to star in the film. But Marty pushed and pushed him to consider Sharon for the role. So Roman reluctantly agreed to meet her. When they first met, they couldn't stand each other. They had dinner, and he was really blunt and made really cruel comments about how she just didn't fit the part. After that awful dinner, he walked her home, and then he tried to kiss her. Somehow, he, like, tripped and tangled his legs in hers, and they both fell down, all intertwined. Sharon got up and smacked him on the head and ran home. She looked back and saw him still on the ground laughing. She called Marty and said, That's the craziest nut I ever met. I will never work with him. Despite the fact that they couldn't stand each other, Marty was like, "Mm, Nah, Sharon's still playing the lead role. The first few weeks of filming were like, a culture shock for Sharon. She was used to working with really sophisticated directors. Roman, like, barked commands at her and threw tantrums, and he would demand take after take after take of Sharon. But she was determined to prove herself a professional actress, so she didn't let him get to her. Within weeks, they had started to warm up to each other. She began to respect his confidence and his drive to take charge of every aspect of the film. Roman also played her love interest in the movie, and he would really soften up and show a more vulnerable side. And when they were in a scene together, there was serious heat. They started a friendship that extended after work hours. He had this flair for living life to the fullest that really seduced her. By the time Sharon had to film her nude scenes, she completely trusted Roman. She was still kind of shy, so she arrived bundled up in a robe. Roman told her, The more you try to cover up and act embarrassed, the more everyone around you will be embarrassed. You're beautiful. Be proud of your body. It's the purest thing a woman can do. Just let go and no one will notice a thing. With Roman's encouragement, Sharon became bolder and freer and determined to just be herself. With Sharon working so much, she wasn't seeing Jay very often. He didn't like that she was doing nude scenes and he was aware that he was losing her and he tried to dominate her, which was the exact opposite of what she wanted. 
He pushed her to the breaking point and she called off the engagement. Before long, she and Roman were sleeping together. Sharon and Jay did remain close friends though and he actually became friends with Roman too. Marty ended up making a lot of changes to the film and that made Roman livid. It wasn't just the name of the movie, he turned it into a joke, something that Roman couldn't even really respect. He told Marty to fuck off and he told his attorney to get him and Sharon both out of their contracts. For the time being, Sharon was still obligated to appear in two of Marty's films, Valley of the Dolls and Don't Make Waves. The bigger Sharon got in her career, the less motivated she was to keep going. There's a quote from Valley of the Dolls that she thought about. It says, You've got to climb to the top of Mount Everest to reach the Valley of the Dolls. There's a brutal climb to reach that peak. You stand there waiting for the rush of exhilaration you thought you'd feel, but it doesn't come. You're alone and the feeling of loneliness is overpowering. It was more fun at the bottom when you started with nothing more than hope and dream of fulfillment. But it's different when you reach the summit. The elements have left you battered, deafened, sightless, and too weary to enjoy your victory. She thought about this often and started thinking about how male-dominated Hollywood is and how she would always have to fight really hard to prove herself. And that was exhausting. Sharon and Roman were in a pretty serious relationship by this point, even though Roman would always continue to sleep around. Like, always. He told her that he wasn't one to settle down, and she told him, I would never want to change you. Although it, it's implied, or, or people believe anyway, that maybe that's not what she wanted. It was She said that to make him happy, and maybe she hoped he would change. Anyway, she ended up asking Marty to let her out of her contract so that she could marry Roman and become a housewife. Roman hadn't proposed or anything yet, but she ended up getting out of her contract, but she had to pay Marty 25% of her earnings until his options expired. But she was free from him. In 1968, Roman and Sharon got married, and I'm going to post pictures of that on BrokenLimelight.com because Sharon's wedding look is so 60s chic, it's adorable. And... Roman, of course, looks like a mousy little ferret or something with, like, British velvet outfit. It's dumb. So Roman and Sharon had spent their last three years traveling and going to movie premieres, and they were now both really successful. Roman made a lot of success with all his movies, especially Rosemary's Baby. But Sharon wanted to settle down, make a home, have a family. Roman didn't want anything to do with that. He always thought of himself as, like, a traveler, a drifter. He actually said something to Sharon like, I wanted to marry a hippie, not a housewife. For a while, they lived in a suite at the Chateau Marmont Hotel in Hollywood, but Roman started bringing all his sketchy friends over. So when Patty Duke offered to lease her house to Sharon, she was like, I'm going whether you join me or not. Roman not only joined her, but he started making an actual effort to make the relationship work. For the next few months, this house became their home. Roman spent a lot more time at home with Sharon. He stopped going out at nights and he started spending the nights with her. So Sharon started to really daydream about having a family and started wanting to have a baby. Roman was still fucking around with other women though. So Sharon actually put a hole in her diaphragm and she was pregnant by January 1969 with the due date in late September. Sharon and Roman were both in different parts of Europe filming their own respective movies, and they had scheduled to take a ship back to the United States together in time for Sharon to have the baby. But at the last minute, Roman told her that he couldn't go because he had a lot of work left to do. She was really upset, and she wanted to stay with him so that she could fly home with him, but she was way too far into her pregnancy. At this point, she was like eight and a half months pregnant. So she was left with no other choice but to get on the ship and go home alone. Now, this is where the Manson family comes in, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. The Manson family was a cult that started in the late 60s. It pretty much started when Charles Manson got out of prison in 1967, and he started pretty much gathering followers. Um, so Charles learned how to play guitar in prison, and when he got out, he moved to San Francisco and basically survived from begging he ended up meeting this librarian assistant named Mary Brunner. She was 23 years old, and he moved in with her. And before long, he convinced her to let other women move in with them. This group became a big hippie family. Charles would play them music, and they all swooned over him. 
He had them convinced that they were the reincarnation of the original Christians and that the Romans were the establishment. They refashioned an old school bus into a big hippie love bus. One day, two members of the Manson family were hitchhiking and were picked up by Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. These were Patricia Krenwinkel, a.k.a. Big Patty, and Ella Jo Bailey. They were both under the influence of LSD, so he brought them to his house in Pacific Palisades for a few hours. He came back and he found Charlie Manson coming out of his house and meeting him into the driveway. So Dennis was like, are you going to hurt me? And Charlie was like, no way. And he bent down and he started kissing his feet. So then they both went inside and Dennis was shocked to find a dozen people in there, mostly female. And they had all made themselves at home. They ended up squatting there for months and they pretty much doubled in numbers. But, like, Charlie made these women act like slaves to him and Dennis. So Dennis ended up, like, paying for all their damages to the house, paying for gonorrhea treatment for all these random girls. He paid for studio time so that Charlie could record his own songs. They even recorded two of Charlie's songs with the Beach Boys. He also introduced Charlie to people like Terry Melcher, a record producer. Charlie auditioned for Terry at his house on, at Terry's house on Cielo Drive, but Terry ultimately declined to sign him. Terry Melcher and Dennis Wilson both ended up cutting ties with Charlie, and Charlie didn't like that. Dennis ended up moving out of that house, and then the landlord evicted the Manson family, so that's when they went to Spawn Ranch. Spawn Ranch was this property that was used to film old western scenes, and Charlie and the family moved in and started living there. So Terry Melcher moved out of that house, and Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski ended up renting it while Sharon was pregnant. Meanwhile, the Manson family is up to just absolute debauchery. They're, like, making a shit ton of noise and setting shit on fire and defecating in public and shit. On the evening of August 8, 1969, a bunch of them got arrested, but police had no idea that among them were killers. But later on, these patrolmen were there and these young girls went up to them and were like, can you help us? There's people back there that want to kill us because we want to leave. And the officer was like, you don't have to worry. We got everyone out of there. And the girls were like, no, there's still a lot more back there. We don't want to get our heads chopped off like they did to Gary. And he was like, Gary. And they were just like, it's nothing. Can you just call our parents? As it turned out, one of these girls had a warrant out for her as a material witness to the murder of someone named Gary Hinman. But they didn't realize that Mary Brunner, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Bruce Davis were associated with that murder, so they let him go. And then one of the Manson family members, Bobby Beausoleil, he was arrested driving the car of Gary Hinman, the murder victim. Just two days after the raid, Charlie told the family that this is the time for Helter Skelter. And they were going to start with the house on Cielo Drive, where Sharon and Roman were now living. It's not clear whether or not Charlie knew that Terry Melcher still lived there or not, but I'll go over that later. So Charlie sent a few of his people and told them to leave a sign, something witchy. While Sharon and Roman had been in Europe, they had a couple of friends keep an eye on their house. This was Wojtek Frykowski and his girlfriend Abigail Folger, also known as Gibby. She was actually the heiress of Folger's coffee. Even though Roman wasn't ready to come home yet, he didn't like the idea of his pregnant wife being home alone, so he asked Wojtek and Gibby to stay home with her until he got back. On the night of August 8th, Roman talked to Sharon on the phone and told her that he'd be home by the 12th. After they got off the phone, Roman went and hung out with a friend of his named Victor Lowndes, who worked with the Playboy Clubs in Europe, which Roman loved. According to Victor, Roman got friendly with some woman and took her home with him. That same night, Jay Sebring came over to hang out with Sharon, Gibby, and Wojtek. They all went out to dinner, and they got home at about 11 p.m. Everybody started to put on their pajamas and started settling in for bed. It was really hot out because it was like August. So Sharon changed into a bikini and then put on like a sheer gown over it just to keep cool. Gibby put on a white nightgown and she went to bed and Wojtek fell asleep on the couch. Sharon and Jay were hanging out in the master bedroom just talking. Shortly after midnight, a 17-year-old boy named Stephen Parent was at Sharon and Roman's house visiting the caretaker who lived at a guest house on the property. He apparently went the wrong way and ended up at the main house, which was just, like, the worst mistake in the world, because that's when four members of the Manson family showed up. These were Tex Watson, Linda Kasabian, 
Patricia Krenwinkel, a.k.a. Big Patty, and Susan, a.k.a. Sadie Atkins. At the time that Stephen pulled up to the house, Tex Watson was cutting the phone lines and the power lines. He saw Stephen and he turned around and walked up to him with a gun in his hand. Stephen, like, begs for his life, saying that he won't tell anyone he saw him. He's just going to go back home and pretend nothing happened. Tex shot him four times right in the face. So then they went over to the window of Sharon's house and they cut open the screen. Linda Kasabian, who had only been in the cult for like a month, stayed outside to keep watch. What's really sad is that the only reason the window was open in the first place was that Sharon had a painter over that day to paint the nursery for the baby. So he had left the window open, but the screen was secured. When they got into the house, Tex whispered something to one of the girls and Wojtek, who was sleeping on the couch, woke up and saw Tex standing over him with a gun. Wojtek said, who are you? And Tex said, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's work. The family went around the house and got everyone into one room. They tied up Sharon and Jay, like tied rope around their necks and they were back to back so that if either one of them moved in any direction, they would choke. Jay was super protective of Sharon, and he started to get pissed because, I mean, she's like eight and a half months pregnant. Like, she's ready to give birth. The family started getting everyone together to tie them up, and there was some kind of scuffle between Jay and Tex or, like, an argument, and that's when Tex stabbed and shot Jay. By this point, Wojtek and Gibby were able to free themselves and made a run for it, but Tex caught up with Wojtek, whose legs had already been stabbed a few times by Susan Atkins, and Tex beat him over the head with a gun and stabbed him multiple times and shot him twice. As all that was happening, Big Patty went after Gibby and stabbed her and tackled her, to the, tackled her to the ground and stabbed her over and over again. While she was getting stabbed, Gibby actually said to her, I'm already dead. So then Tex went over and they both finished stabbing her. She was stabbed 28 times total. Wojtek wasn't dead yet, though, so he struggled across the lawn, and Tex went back over to him and stabbed him until he died. He was stabbed 51 times total. Inside, Sharon was begging for her child's life. She begged them to just let her give birth to the baby, and then she would give herself up to them. She was stabbed 16 times by Susan Atkins and died crying out for her mother. Nearby, there was actually a, a group of girls who were on a camping trip and heard all the screams from this, from this murder happening. Linda Kasabian, she was the one who was just keeping watch. She actually tried to tell them all to stop, and she even tried to tell them that somebody was coming just to get them to stop. But Susan Atkins looked at her and said, it's too late. Big Patty then grabbed a towel that had been used to bind their hands together and used it to write the word pig in blood on the door. She did this to make it look like Gary Hinman's crime scene so that the police would think the murderer was still free and maybe they would let Bobby Beausoleil go. That's the dumbass who was caught driving Gary Hinman's car. It's also been said that Charlie had ordered them to hang someone and make it look like a reverse lynching so that people would blame the Black Panthers. It seems most likely that Charlie knew that Terry no longer lived there Terry says that Charlie knew he really lived somewhere else because he actually sent him a letter or something once, like some kind of threatening note, I think. But Terry lived the rest of his life in total fear and paranoia that he was going to be next. Susan Atkins would later say that they hit the Cielo Drive house to instill fear in Terry Melcher. For a while, the police weren't sure what happened or who the killers were. By the way, don't look up crime scene photos for this unless you are ready to see some really bloody, fucked up shit. Like, I don't even want to put them on my website. Maybe I'll put on, like, I'll put, like, some kind of warning beforehand or something. Charlie Manson was apparently pissed that they didn't carry out the murder correctly, and they didn't steal enough money either. So he had them commit another murder the very next night, the LaBianca murders. On August 16th, the police raided Spawn Ranch. They were looking for stolen vehicles and arrested at least 26 people for burglary. Among those arrested was Susan Atkins, who pretty much immediately spilled all the beans in jail. By November 1969, she had told the entire story to her cellmate, who turned her in. Little by little, as they started interviewing the suspects, they all started coming clean and admitting to the murders at Cielo Drive, and the La Bianca murders, and quite a few other murders. Roman Polanski was, of course, shattered by the news. He flew home right away and was so hysterical that he had to be heavily sedated. 
Sharon's father decided to hold his own investigation before the Manson family was even suspected. There were all these rumors going around that Sharon and, and Roman had more than dabbled with drugs and perhaps this was related to a drug deal or something like that. Sharon's father ended up interviewing all the hippie celebrities who were known for doing drugs and partying. Among them were Mama Cast Elliot and John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas. This is the same John Phillips I talk about in episode one, by the way. He's Mackenzie Phillips' father. John apparently had a pretty aggressive temper, and maybe the drugs made him kind of paranoid too. He started blaming this guy Doyle, who was dating Mama Cass, and he was a drug dealer. And Doyle accused Roman of sleeping with John's wife, Michelle Phillips, and then Doyle suggested that maybe John killed Sharon as revenge. As it turns out, none of that was true. Just a bunch of paranoid hippies throwing each other under the bus. As we know now, the Manson family was arrested, including Charles Manson and many of his followers. And we know now that they are indeed the ones who killed Sharon Tate. So that's the story of how Sharon Tate and her unborn baby were killed by the Manson family. She was only 26 years old. There's a lot to talk about, though, with Roman Polanski, though. In 1977, just eight years after Sharon's death, Roman Polanski was arrested and charged with drugging and raping a 13-year-old girl. And I'm going to cover that later this month, so make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast. I'm currently reading the book The Girl, A Life in the Shadow of Roman Polanski, it's actually written by that 13-year-old girl who he abused. That's all I got for today. If you have strong feelings or opinions about this episode, head on over to BrokenLimelight.com and leave a comment under this episode's page. I would love to hear your thoughts and interact with you guys a little bit. Before I wrap up, let me tell you about the October giveaway. I will be giving away a $25 gift card to Spencer's, which can also be used at Spirit Halloween stores. The winner will also receive their very own Broken Limelight t-shirt. This contest will be held on Facebook, so you must have a Facebook account and like Broken Limelight on Facebook in order to be entered. For more details, you can look up our Facebook posts or you can go to BrokenLimelight.com. Alright guys, that's all I got. See you later!